Coming up in this video, I'm going to talk to you about how I airbrush miniatures and models. Hey everyone, welcome back to Mini Junkie. So I said off the top, uh, this video is going to be all about how I approach airbrushing miniatures and models because I use my airbrush in a lot of my videos and I do see a lot of comments about how do I do this either how do I do it without an airbrush or how do I go about get, getting started with airbrushing or what is your airbrush setup etc. Now I'll mention this a little bit later in the video but it, when it comes to the actual equipment when it comes to the actual airbrush you're using there's so many videos about that on YouTube right now um, and Rob Paints Models just did a really good one where he went all over the types of airbrushes brands compressors etc and I'm not going to reinvent the wheel because it's just not necessary it's already been done but I will talk a little bit about the kind of gear I use more so I want to talk about how I approach using an airbrush to, to paint miniatures how do you know what's the philosophy of it how how do you go about it what steps do I use an airbrush for and what steps do I not use an airbrush for that kind of thing so it's more about some of the thinking behind it as opposed to the nuts and bolts of thinning paint and getting a compressor at 30 psi and that kind of stuff that's all stuff that you can learn from any number of videos on here and i even talk about it sometimes in some of my other videos now just a warning this is a little dry and i use powerpoint to illustrate some of my points and to to walk through some of the thinking i don't know why i'm doing that i just didn't feel like doing it as i'm like trying to airbrush a, a model i just i'd rather actually show you with very clear sort of diagrams instead and so this is going to be kind of a weird video, not something I would normally do, but I want it to be mostly informative. I want it to inform anyone who's looking to get into airbrushing specifically for miniatures and scale models and the models that you see coming from companies like Games Workshop. So with all that said, let's get into that exciting and sizzly PowerPoint action. So as far as airbrush specs, I said I re wouldn't really get into, <clears throat> you know, what, you know, choice of airbrush hardware. And compressors but I'll just go over it real quick um, Rob paints models did a recent video that I'll link uh, is covering all of this stuff and I thought he did a great job and there's a, a lot of other channels that have gone into this it's you know orc painter nerd or spiky bits they're you know how to choose a good airbrush is pretty much all over YouTube so that's not a problem for most of you uh, the picture the one I have a picture of here is a water eclipse this is the one I tend to recommend the most for beginners it's a nice sort of mid-range workhorse brush that kind of covers any any of your needs and I find is very very reliable and easy to maintain does a great job a couple of other options could be like harder and Steinbeck or Steinbeck I don't know how to say it um, the ultra or badger I think makes one you know that just do a little research and it's very easy to find but generally speaking you're looking for dual action which simply means that you can either just push down on the trigger for air alone and then pull back on the trigger for uh, paint flow so it lets you just uh, if it's single action you can only shoot paint which can be inconvenient uh, when you're doing work gravity feed which means you're putting paint into this cup and the paint is simply going into the brush through gravity as opposed to siphon feed where the airbrush sucks the paint up out of a bottle and shoot for a 0.2 to 0.5 millimeter nozzle size I tend to use a 0.3 sort of right in the middle 0.2 can be a little more prone to clogging depending on the paint you're using and how much you thin it 0.5 or larger you may you almost might get into too much paint flow so shoot for somewhere in that range and then cheap you know you can find budget no name Chinese knockoff type brands of airbrushes online for sure on Amazon and eBay and elsewhere I wouldn't super recommend that. I'd recommend, you know, shooting for about a hundred dollar airbrush, uh, ideally a brand name. It is true that yes, a uh, budget brush, a no name brush is going to work technically, but in the long run, it's likely you're going to start to have problems with it. I mean, you get what you pay for. Uh, you're going to find it has cheaper components, cheaper seals, cheaper valves. You know, I found, I, I tried buying one just to try it out. I found it heavy and clunky. So there's not a lot of preci precise machining going on there or, uh, you know, nice materials. And the thing is, if you're starting to airbrush, eliminate the things that could cause you problems. And one of the things could be buying a cheap ass airbrush. Sorry, I, this should be a family channel. 
if you buy a good name brand airbrush, you are just more likely to have a good experience and then you're more likely to stick with it and learn to become really adept at using it. So I'm always in favor of just buying the best you can afford to buy so that you can worry more about air pressure and paint consistency versus is your airbrush a piece of garbage and just giving you trouble because it's cheap. Compressors. I use um, this one up here. It's way overkill for the majority of, of hobbyists. It has two airbrush uh, outlets, so I have my siphon and my gravity feed attached to it. But yeah, it's totally overkill. Generally speaking, shoot for an, an airbrush or go for an airbrush um, compressor that looks like one of these pictured. Usually a starter would be this one here, this Iwata on the bottom left. Uh, or you could go for something a little bit more of a step up. I think Rob Paints models had something like this. But for specs, look for something that says it's maintenance free, oilless, comes with a moisture trap. So that's this thing here, which prevents water. You know, the compressor will build up water from doing its thing. And that water can make its way into your air hose and cause all kinds of pain and suffering as you're splattering paint everywhere. That's what this uh, trap is for. And you see this one and this one, they all basically have it. And quiet operation is nice. If you're gonna be doing a lot of airbrushing, they can get really loud. Um, but So if you get a nice quiet one, it's gonna be a little more pleasant to use and more pleasant for your family or your neighbors. Um, I, You can technically go to the hardware store and get a compressor used for tools or something. But then you're going to be looking for adapters to adapt that to whatever hose and airbrush you're using. And you may find it's loud and clunky. It's just, it's not made as a hobby thing. It's made as a tool construction thing. So I don't know. I'm all about getting the right tool for the, for the job. And for me, that's what these are. Um, so I wouldn't personally recommend a hardware store compressor. All right, guys, I'm using PowerPoint just to give you a visual of the, the concept of how an airbrush works so that when you're spraying you'll understand um, how your distance and how much air and and how much you're pulling back in the trigger and all that kind of stuff is affecting the paint job you're applying on any particular miniature and this is hopefully a l that's close to scale <laughs> didn't spend a long time figuring it out this is the airbrush I use the most um, Iwata HPC Plus. I think I misinformed someone in the comments of another video about which, which airbrush I use. Uh, it's a little high end. You don't necessarily need something this fancy. So yeah, I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about how you actually paint these models and miniatures with your airbrush. Okay. So the concept here is that the airbrush shoots a cone of paint. The cone is, you know, denser with paint and more narrow the cone, uh, the closer you are to the to the nozzle of the airbrush as you get further out you're going to get a wider dispersion of paint and it's going to be more diffuse so it's going to be more you know speckly um you know it kind of depends how how hard you're you're sort of spraying but the further out you go you're going to get sort of a, a more diffuse coverage on your model and it's going to cover a larger area so for example if you're trying to spray your space marine and highlight his knee pad and you spray from this far away the whole space marine is going to be blue but if you hold the space marine really close to your airbrush and you pull back gently and carefully and slowly on your trigger to let the paint out you can actually, you'd be surprised how small of an area you can actually highlight with an airbrush. Um, don't recommend that necessarily for beginners, but that's the concept. Back when you're out here, this is how I recommend people think about an airbrush in terms of priming or applying varnish. I mean, when, I, I guess when you're varnishing, maybe you want to be like around here as far as distance and as far as how big the cone is and you know that way you're getting getting your coverage or if you're trying to avoid metallics you could maybe even do it closer up but with priming you know you're going to cover most of your model pretty quickly if you're not holding it too close to the airbrush that's it that's the concept the airbrush only knows how to shoot a cone right it'll either shoot it you know if you w open it wide but you don't use too much air and by open wide i mean just push down and pull back or sorry, pull back on the trigger so that you're making the nozzle hole big, but you're very gently pushing air out. You're gonna have something like that where it's diffusing very quickly into a big pattern and not a focus pattern. And then the, f 
and then it's going to be more like this as you pull back and push down fully and you're spraying full air and full paint the close again the closer you are the darker the paint is the more the faster the coverage is going to be this also you know when you're out here it's going to be covering a little bit less quickly because it's so diffuse you're going to need to be spraying for a, a bit longer to, to make sure you get complete coverage the reason this is important to know so let's say you often hear about zenithal priming so that's a situation where let's say this guy was black and you wanted to come down with white i'm going to leave it blue just so you can see it you're effectively going to do this you're spraying down and what's ha let's see if i can do this you're spraying down onto the miniature right like this it doesn't want to go there like that let's say let's make it like this more depending on how you know if you're going to be far enough away that it's going to be hitting sort of like this and it's only hitting let's say more like this this paint is only hitting the first thing it hit, hits so to speak it's think of it as a beam of light this thing you know the miniature would create shadow beyond that source the light source so the paints hitting here 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 the top of his head the front of his head the upper surface of his arm it's not getting to very much of the legs because the upper body is is covering it although remember this is a 3d model so his legs stick out more in the back and stuff like that that's the concept of a zenithal prime another idea is that let's say you wanted to highlight just the head and the upper you know the backpack and you don't want to get the whole body in so what you could do and I often use this technique to, to do like uh, cloaks is you angle your spray let's even bring the let's bring the airbrush with us this isn't perfect obviously you angle your spray such that it's only hitting the part you want and it's not hitting all this other stuff because like I said this cone is fairly predictable Think of it as a beam of light and you're shining the light only where you want those highlights to hit and then beyond keeping in mind of course anything over here is going to get paint on it so you maybe want an airbrush booth or something i i tend to not care too much and i'm just used to it and i let the paint go all over the place because i'm messy but and also if you don't sort of pull back too far on the brush or sorry on the trigger you can get a lighter it's going to again be more diffuse so then you're going to move your miniature a little closer and you see you get more paint depending on you can also of course hold the miniature differently that's the idea whoops don't distort the miniature himself but yeah i will often highlight my miniatures by spraying fairly close and then by keeping the paint all the way back but not too much air and that's going to create something like this where your cone is a little bit more focused and just spray the highlights on very carefully you can also sort of burst your air so then it's just going so that the cone isn't constant and that can help you sort of see where the paint is landing and then adjust based on that uh, to where you want to be hitting but the number one thing i just wanted to get across was this idea of the airbrush shooting in a cone whether that cone is like this or this uh, it varies depending on how much you're pushing down and how much you're pulling back and then where your your distance from the miniature to, will drive how much paint is hitting it at once and how quickly or if it's getting a larger coat um, and taking a little longer to cover because it's getting hit by diffused paint diffused something like that dispersed I don't know how to say it don't know which is the right word but again if you think about it this nothing on this miniature nothing would be going sort of past here on the miniature because he's blocking it again think of it as a light but everything he's blocking is hitting him so he's getting color on him that is the basics of how i airbrush miniatures really um, i prime them like that i varnish them like this and i often apply base coats so for example if I'm base coating, I'm doing a slightly narrower cone based on how I'm treating the trigger. And I am trying to just get it on, you know, here, here, and here, and on his legs. Okay? 
you have questions, post below. But this is the gist of it. This is the start of how. Um, oh, and one more th thing is that this cone will have an easier time of coming out and dispersing, uh, dependent on how much you thin the paint that you're putting in this part here. Hopefully, you can see my cursor. The top, the what do you call that thing? I'm blanking. The gravity well. Um, if that's 50-50 mixed with like an airbrush medium or thinner, that's going to help it spray a little bit more evenly, a little more, you know, not to splatter, not to spider web. Spider webbing is when you're so close and the paint is too runny, so it blasts and hits the surface and then little spider webs of paint go everywhere because it's not drying on the surface fast enough. Okay, so that's the, if you're, if you're getting spider webbing, you're too thin or you're too close. You know, if you're if you're thin enough, you could be out here and not get spider webbing. So you start to, you really just need to get an airbrush, mix your paint with some airbrush medium or flow imp air, airbrush flow improver. Don't use Windex or water if you're just looking for an easy time. They they work sometimes, but they can be more difficult to work with. The airbrush medium and flow improver is going to do a better job of playing nice with your acrylic paints. Uh, in my case, I'm using I think it's a point three millimeter nozzle which allows the paint to flow if you go lower you're going to have a little bit more chance of block of uh, clogging just means you need to thin the paint a little more and if you have a larger like a point point four point five millimeter uh, you just need to be ready that it's going to come out like you know faster and in a wider cone I think I I think this is making sense I hope it is um, I will also note that I remove see these two things here these are the um, or it may just be the one on the end that's the nozzle or the needle cap protects the needle from when you bang the airbrush on your desk or hit it on the floor or whatever <laughs> if you hit the needle tip it is very prone to bending because they're very finely machined pieces I take it off though because I'm used to handling the airbrush and because what can happen is while you're airbrushing, if, if you airbrush for several minutes using one color, it's going to start to accumulate on the tip of the brush and that's going to affect the, the cleanliness of this of this cone that's coming out because it's trying to work its way past dry paint to the point where it could just completely clog. So by leaving the cap off, I just take my, I use my fingers with a glove on or whatever and I literally just wipe off the tip with my finger, um, you know, just sort of twirl it in your fingers to get all the paint off and pull it off and then and you know sometimes you have to almost scratch it off with your nail if it's been drying too long but that's how you keep your tip from clogging your brush because it's got some paint accumulating you almost always will need to do this um, so if you're leaving the cap on you're gonna have more trouble with that unless you find a way to clean that needle maybe it's like a sponge that you can or a q-tip you can get in there so there's a lot of different a lot of different ways I just got used to not using the needle cap so here we got our airbrush I want to show you another way you can use uh, an airbrush for like highlighting all right so you're spraying your color let's say maybe it's not quite such a big cone because of the way you're manipulating the trigger between air and paint and one thing you can do is highlight let's say a cloak and so what I'm gonna do is draw like what a cloak if you look straight down or straight up at a cloak on a miniature it usually looks like this right I'm just doing a crappy version so if you wanted to highlight the cloak easily with an airbrush, you, you know, God willing, the bumps are kind of roughly the right, you know, you spray so that the one edge of your cone is only hitting the highest points of the, of the cloak. And this is a terrible example. I'm not, I didn't draw a very good one. Now what's going to happen here is it's only hitting, even though despite what my drawing looks like, it's going to hit this side of each of the bumps of the cloak. It's not going to hit perfectly on either side of it because of this, you know, remember the light beam analogy where the light would hit here and the shadow would be here. So the paint will go past this. And, you know, you can basically what you can do is you move your, move your airbrush around so that this cone, which I'm not doing a good job of either, moves around too ideally a little bit less this, this illustration is becoming pretty challenging you know what I mean so you're spraying so that just the edge of your cone is hitting those bumps and then when you're done now uh, you come over on this side and you're gonna you know if you if your cloak didn't get the kind of highlights you're hoping for 
maybe one side isn't quite right, you can come to the other side. You just basically hold the miniature a certain way so that you can spray it and hit some of the bumps this way. It's a terrible, terrible way of showing this, but you hopefully get the idea that this is just, this is constantly just a cone. And so you work the angles when it comes to the airbrush. You work different angles. Let's say you have something roughly cube shaped. You know, if you spray like this, like that, you could just hit the corner right here, or you could create a circle in the middle by hitting the paint here. That's how this works. So hopefully you've kind of picked up on this either from watching previous videos or other painters or whatever, but you've got two sets of tools at your disposal when it comes to painting miniatures and models and, and Warhammer, etc. You've got the airbrush, whether it be this kind or siphon feed, or it's got, um, you know, different, you know, it's cheaper, whatever. Just the point is it's an airbrush. And and on the other side, you've got all your hobby brushes. Usually you're not going to need anything higher than like a size two. And usually you're not going to need to be going down to like a triple zero. So in the sweet spot is kind of between double zero and two for painting miniatures for the majority of people. And don't pay much attention to the how these look. They're just, I just grabbed something off the internet. So you're combining both when, it, when you're doing miniatures to get the best effect and to speed things up and occasionally to get some nice blending going with the airbrush. So with the airbrush, you're using it for priming. It's going to really speed that up. Varnishing, you can varnish your whole model very, very quickly with the airbrush and get a nice, you know, almost, well, as far as I know, never get frosting like you can get from a can. Base coats, so if you get, as you get a little more experience, especially when it's things like Space Marines where they're almost all one color, you get used to doing base coats as you get more experienced. Object source lighting becomes easier with an airbrush, so you create that sense of a diffuse glow around an area easily using the airbrush, which creates the nice blends. Highlighting as you get better, like I said when I showed how to do, like highlighting a cloak or fur, for example. Spraying at edges, spraying at angles, and hitting just a portion of what you're what you're kind of trying to highlight is how you use your hairbrush for highlighting. It takes practice, obviously. And pupils, you'd be surprised how easy it is to do pupils with your airbrush. And when it comes to the brushes, so let's say you've done all this quick work with your airbrush, you've got a base coat down, it's a little bit messy. Then you get into do, using your brush for layering your highlights, for dry brushing for doing edge highlights, for doing washes and glazes, and any details like, like pupils. Um, you combine both sets of tools to get fast, easier, arguably, and really nice looking results versus just trying to do everything with brushes, which is achievable, but just can just take longer and give you less flexibility. Another thing that airbrushes make it really easy to do that I forgot to mention is painting colors like yellow red, orange, or white over black primer. Black is obviously a very popular color for priming and if you try to hand paint yellow or orange or I think I'm I think I got most of the trouble colors here over black you're going to have a rough day. You can do it. You're going to take a lot of thin coats. It's going to be a pain in the butt. And you're probably going to get a lot of uh, streaking and paint brush strokes. But the airbrush easy peasy. You can do any of these colors onto your black primer. It takes maybe a couple coats of you know putting it on thin, but honestly, it's not even that hard, and it'll go on really nice and smooth and get great coverage over your black uh, primer. So in terms of workflow, it's a little tricky to describe this because it's a little more complicated than this. But generally, I try to push the harder something's going to be to fix, the later I'm pushing it in my workflow. That doesn't mean it's last in the workflow or right at the end, but it means I'm going to try and do the hard to fix stuff towards the end. For example, face is a great example. You want the face to look great. I usually do that almost last because I don't want to screw it up with it, any intermediate steps. Some of the things that are hard to fix are really nice airbrush blends. You want to do those a little bit later versus doing them when they can get messed up. Lighter colors are harder to fix than dark colors. So if you paint a beautiful yellow and you get some black splattered on it, that's harder to fix than it is if you have a nice black or blue and you get a little bit of yellow on that. That's much easier to cover up. Something like object source lighting, if you get a beautiful you know, rendition of light hitting a surface, 
you want to preserve that so you want to do that towards the end of the process of a miniature easier to things to fix if you're just dry brushing an area and then you get some paint on that it's usually easy to fix that just dry brush over it again dark colors are easy to fix like I said and edge highlighting also easy to fix because it's just a line along the edge of something if it gets broken up a little bit by some paint you can just reapply it now to sort of caveat or to layer on top of that there's two things you need to worry about when you think about whether it's going to be hard to fix you got to think about the other steps you're going to be doing in the process if you're going to be doing other airbrushing or dry brushing that you can think of as messy because it's harder to control and so you're more likely to let's say you you get a beautiful yellow blend and right next to it is a big area of cape you want to do black if you airbrush that black you're very likely to get you know some overspray onto the yellow and wreck it that's what you got to think about so instead you would airbrush the cloak black first and then you would airbrush the yellow after that washes are sometimes hard to control and sometimes not it depends on the size of the area so you have to use your judgment there if you're going to be sloshing it all over the place you want to be careful it's not going to get on something that you put a lot of work into and it's going to possibly hard, be hard to fix things that are neat and controlled there's layering with a you know a size one a size zero whatever it is or detailing anything where you're using a brush in a controlled fashion you're much less likely to make a mess or to get it where you don't want it to be so I would say you can be a little bit more relaxed about those kind of steps a little bit later in your process um, without worrying about wrecking stuff you did previously you might be hearing piano I'm not sure my kids practicing upstairs so if I have an average miniature here's maybe how I would approach the flow of the work so an example workflow on any given miniature first I'm gonna prime it with my airbrush and that could include zenithal priming if I feel like it but either way it's gonna be either the white or the black primer now the dry brush it depends on depends on the size of the area that's going to be dry brushed if it's just a bit of fur and I can be very controlled with it or if it's the whole miniature that's going to determine when I'm going to dry brush so it's a little that one's definitely movable within the flow then I'm going to base apply base colors with the airbrush onto the dry primer I'm going to possibly airbrush highlights by adding a little bit of you often see me add a bit of bone color to my mix or to my original base color when I apply highlights and I'm going to spray on a smaller and smaller area and from the angles where the lights coming from then I might apply a wash or washes when that's dry I may do some layering of the highlights in certain areas and some of the final steps I'm going to do are detailing you know like uh, gun handles or lenses or faces etc and when everything's dry the final step is going to be varnish with the airbrush and then probably basing these days I do basing last but that's an idea of how I'm mixing up both using brush and airbrush to do miniatures instead of just using an air you're almost never gonna just use an airbrush and you're almost never just get well if you're wanting to embrace airbrushing you're probably gonna stop using just a brush to paint entire miniatures hey guys quick caveat that I should have said at the beginning of the video but I totally forgot and now it's hard to insert with my editing program everything you just heard was my point of view my opinion based on my experiences and how I approach airbrushing as with any hobby like fly fishing or photography there is plenty of people with experiences that differ or will have different opinions on how to airbrush or what to use that's totally cool you should watch their videos too and get some different points of view this was just mine so that's my thought process and approach to airbrushing miniatures and models if you have any additional questions post them below and I'll answer in the comments or maybe even in a future video I hope you'll consider sharing liking and subscribing to the channel and we'll see you next time thanks for watching